do you drive with one foot? I don't know! Oh, no! I mean, I'm not very flexible, but this seems doable. Hey, GQ, my name's Tim Harney. I'm a car fabricator, and you are watching The Breakdown. So this is Transformers. Look, this isn't something, you know, I can't just read this stuff. Look, I, I was such a Transformers not. fan. It's just like the, exactly what led me into building cars. This is a huge engine. This engine would never belong in this crusty, crusty car. You can actually see there's like bead rolling on the side of the fender wells. Like this is definitely never in that car. This is like photo edited in there. But that is a humongous, probably like a 500 CC some odd engine, but those little guys sticking out, those are called uh, independent throttle bodies. Each cylinder has its own carburetor, and those those little squiggly lines on top, those are fuel lines. And so that's usually that's meant for like a massive amount of gas and air. And th that's like uh, those like top fuel engines that doesn't belong in there. Totally wrong. Whoa, nice headers. You've got a high rise double pump carburetor. That's it's pretty impressive, Sam. So she's talking about high-rise headers, so that goes, the headers go above the engine. For engines that produce a lot of horsepower, they, they work so fast that they don't need a big exhaust, and it doesn't really matter, they're really loud, so it's usually meant for like race cars. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have that on a street car. It squirts the fuel in so you can go faster. Oh, I like to go faster. Typically, like, only high-performance cars have double pumpers. Initially on carburetors, there's always something that sprays a little bit of gas in, but then on high performance carbs, the they can have a secondary pump, which sprays a bunch more gas in. You know, all an engine is, is basically harnessing an explosion. So more fire, more air, bigger explosion. It looks like your, uh, your distributor cap's a little loose. If your distributor cap was loose, that's, that is your points. You probably wouldn't have a distributor cap if you had that engine. You would have electronic ignition or timing or something like that. You wouldn't have this huge, big engine and then just have this like old antiquated distributor cap. But your distributor cap is, is basically this thing inside your engine. It's this round thing. It's what all the spark plugs go from. And inside is basically a little thing that spins. And each time it spins and hits this contact point is what sends the spark to the spark plug. Your car wouldn't be going anywhere. The distributor cap coming a little loose, That probably wouldn't happen. That huge engine fitting inside of that engine bay, it's pushing it, but probably could be. Other than that, it, it's actually fairly accurate. You gotta have about 2,000 horsepower in that thing. Try 3,000. Try five. Okay, let's rewind that. They think he has 5,000 horsepower, which is like, Ridiculous. His engine would be sticking out of his hood. It would be humongous. 5,000 horsepower is useless in a street car because you wouldn't get any traction. You need humongous tires. Even, even the Bentley shooting a little thing off of it, the Bentley probably would fold in half. It's like made out of aluminum. Stretch him out, hold him. So the Rock is driving this this International. That car would probably pull all the rest of those cars. So like that International has is like a big diesel motor and it's just like meant for hauling like 18 wheelers and you know like 40,000 pounds and all of those cars they would all they would do is just slip around and that that diesel engine would just yank all those cars away. Your horsepower is only directly proportionate to your traction. If you have really big tires and really, or sorry, really big rims and really small tires, you don't get a lot of traction. That's why like F1 cars have really big, thick tires. You need, you need your tire to actually kind of flex and bend a little bit to actually get traction or else all you're doing is just kind of skipping and spinning it on the street. And this is a Jaguar that uh, Jason Statens and his tires are catching on fire? Yeah, I think your brakes would catch on fire. I mean, like, listen, if you if you sit and you do a burnout in a car, eventually it's gonna eat away all the rubber, it's gonna get really hot, once in a while they'll catch fire, but like, and then it'll just pop the tire, and then now you're just done your rim. You just melted your tire off. Get out of there. Stop working on it. Stop working on it and do it. <laughs> nice. 
NOS. This um, company called NOS, all it is is it allows more oxygen into your engine. If you have more oxygen and more gas in your engine, bigger the explosion, hotter the explosion. So adding NOS to it is like a sneaky way of getting more oxygen into your combustion chamber. So having two huge tanks like that would be ridiculous. You, you only need one. So fire coming out of the back? Yeah, that's, that's reasonable. When you have fire that comes out of the back, that typically doesn't happen while you're accelerating. It happens while you're decelerating because some of the spent gases in your exhaust catch fire and then come out the back of the exhaust. Like if you've ever seen a, a really fast car going down the highway and you'll see like a blip of, of fire coming to the back, it's usually because their mixture is a little off and they have a little residual gas in their exhaust. And so what's happened here is it's got tons of gas and air going into this 5,000 horsepower engine. That would mean that fire was happening inside the engine and then continually going down the exhaust, which is, needless to say, a horrible thing for that to happen. <laughs> huh? Bentleys are like made out of nothing. Ah, all right, I'll pause it there. That's like a 5,000 pound car. Flipping a 5,000 pound car is very, very difficult. I don't care how many like tethered what have you. It's like next to impossible to flip a Bentley. Like you, you can drive it like a total asshole and it's not gonna, it, it just won't roll over. So it flipping front way over, I'd, I'd say that's impossible. <laughs> Doors come off easily. Whenever you want your door to pop off your car, all you gotta do is just give it a nudge. That's totally, totally true. Ah, yeah, 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 cars do that all the time. Yeah, cars flip this way all the time. Stationary, totally. I like that if on this freeze frame, it looks like his wheels are bent in. So like, it, whatever comes after this shot, if his car is still moving, that would be impossible. If you had your wheels bent like that, that would mean that your axles broke, or your rear end broke, or you're in a movie and it's not real. But anyways, okay, like. Oh, there it is, yeah, look. So if you stop it, you can see on the bottom of the car, nothing is attached. So there's no subframe. This car has a frame, typically, and that car doesn't have a frame, which is weird. And it has no drive shaft, and it also looks like it has no engine. Oh, and then it also, it, it, they CGI'd a, an exhaust that has a cross, crisscross, which is, which is good, but they like forgot some stuff. I like good movies, and Fast and Furious is not like a good movie, but it's terribly entertaining. If this is fueling somebody's imagination and this is inspiring, I think that's great. So, I mean, it actually, like, once upon a time, like when Fast and Furious 1 came out, it like revitalized the car industry. The United States was bedrocked in these like Mopar muscle cars and you learn from your pop in the, in the backyard and things, and, and now it became like, what fuel injector sizes, and like, oh, I have an inline four, and I have a turbo, and these movies help that industry. Most everything in this whole scene is totally unrealistic. This is a clip from the first Fast and the Furious. Yeah, my dad built her. 900 horses of Detroit muscle. All right, so he says 900 horsepower of Detroit muscle. That very well could be true. So what he's got on top is something called a Whipple supercharger. And then he's got what looks like a huge bit, big block. It is like abnormally large supercharger. Superchargers essentially shoot compressed air into your combustion chamber. So when you add compressed gas, or rather colder compressed air and a lot of gas, you have a way bigger explosion. So if you've ever had like a campfire and you're sitting and you blow air underneath, that's what a compressor does, and especially that one. This was like the tough guy car. Like if you had like a supercharger, and the best part is like, there's no way to get that under your hood. So that you'd have to cut out a hole. And then once upon a time, I think it was Dodge that had these things called the, the shaker hoods. But yeah, all of this stuff was real. And this car actually in real life is, I mean, it was, it was a real car, and it really did have 900 horsepower. Know what she ran in Palmdale? No, what did she run? Nine seconds flat. 
Nine second flat car is like ridiculously fast. So he's talking about quarter mile times, running your car in a quarter mile in nine seconds, your car could run a 36 second mile. That's a fast car. You're going 145 miles an hour in a quarter of a mile. I doubt that that car could do that, but maybe. If it's a nine second car, then that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I was driving so much torque the chassis twisted coming off the line. So he's talking about there's so much torque in this that the chassis twists, that actually happens. Again, if you had 900 horsepower on that frame, which is like a dinky piece of steel, they just literally twist, and you'd see the car would just be like bent a little bit or it would drive sideways down the road like this, it's weird. Torque is a better description of horsepower. And so when, they, when they're talking about torque in terms of how much pound, foot pounds torque, a car has, that's a better description of how much power it has. So like if you have 900 horsepower car, but you can't get any traction, then your car doesn't have very much torque. Your engine has a lot of torque, your car might not have a lot of torque. And like if you have a lot, too much torque on a car, it'll just lift up. That scene was surprisingly totally realistic. And even Paul Walker's reaction to that engine, just like, ah, oh, like downstruck. I'd be the same way. So next up we have uh, my cousin Vinny. If these two equal length tire marks had pause attraction, can't make those marks without pause attraction, which was not available on the 64 Buick Skylark. So she's talking about something called pause traction. Cars in the 70s and 60s, they, they had a fixed axle rear end and there was only three cars that had independent rear suspension. And so the idea behind having independent rear suspension is that you have your wheels are on the ground more, you have better traction. And this whole scene is about that the tires are even, which mean that you would have to have independent rear suspension. I find it hard to believe that this kind of information could be ascertained simply by looking at a picture. You could tell by looking at a photo of tire marks, right? Like a car peeling out and going really fast and laying down a bunch of rubber, you'd need to know your stuff to know. This movie came out in like the 90s, right? And she's talking about cars from the 60s, but she's actually wrong in this. She said two cars had it, three cars had it. The 64 Skylark had a regular differential, which anyone who's been stuck in the mud in Alabama knows you step on the gas, one tire spins, the other tire does nothing. That is correct. So what she's describing, if it has a limited slip differential, limited slip means that this is your engine, your drive shaft comes back, it goes into your differential, that gearbox I was talking about, and with a limited slip, it allows one wheel to torque differently than another wheel. And the idea is that you want to maintain power. So let's say I'm going over a bump. This rotates faster just for a minute than this wheel does. If you had a fixed axle, right, without a limited slip, both of these would rotate at the same amount. And so you would see that break in tire marks. The 64 Skylark had a solid rear axle. Yep. So when the left tire would go up on the curb, the right tire would tilt out and ride along its edge. But that didn't happen here. The tire marks stayed flat and even this car had an independent rear suspension. <laughs> this is my like future wife right there. No. So she uh, she's describing something, it's 100% accurate. Again, when you have independent suspension, this tire goes up and is still maintaining traction. And this one's just going on its level surface right here. These, these tires are capable of spinning and moving at the same kind of forward momentum. And that's only achievable with a limited slip or independent rear suspension. In the 60s, there were only two other cars made in America that had positive traction and independent rear suspension and enough power to make these marks. One was the Corvette. The other was the 1963 Pontiac. Tempest. And the Corvair. Corvair was a rear-engined American car that they they wanted to make it into like a, a muscle car, but it was like kind of, it was more like European. Also had an independent rear suspension, also that same year. My Cousin Vinny is, is like iconically accurate on, on everything she's describing. And her accent is also pretty spot on too. This is Pineapple Express. I did a race once upon a time that uh, the entire race was backwards. It's only one gear going backwards. So you don't go very fast, but yeah, you could totally drive a car backwards for as long as you want. 
I think they were trying to show in the movie how like relatively slow it was going. It wasn't like an exaggerated Hollywood bump, but like those cars are actually meant to, they used to have like pusher bars and they were designed, they were reinforced in the front so they could push cars out of the way. Most cars are made out of just like really thin 18 gauge steel. And so if you shoot a car, nothing would happen. It would just bounce around in the gas can. So. No, cars don't really explode anymore. Like if I were to take a gas tank of a car and light it, it would just shoot flames out of the top, but it wouldn't explode. When you see a car explode, it's typically, um, it's when it's compressed, compressed gas explodes like for fuel injection. If you have that, that catches fire or something, or if you hit somebody on the side of their car and the gas line's right there, yeah, that'll, that'll explode. What would probably happen is that the bullet would pierce the metal and it wouldn't ignite anything. All it would do is just make a hole and then gas would start dumping out. How do you drive with one foot? I don't know. Ah, oh, no. I mean, I'm not very flexible, but this seems doable. Windows on cars are tempered but they have safety glass in them. So windshields and side view glass are different. I think it was back in like the 70s, United States made that all windshields need to be safety glass. So if something hits it, it'll shatter. So it doesn't have like really sharp pieces of glass. So you like get stabbed on. If you look at it from a you know funny angle, you'll see it has like kind of a wavy line to it. And that's because there's plastic inside of it. And they sandwich two pieces of tempered glass and that's what makes a windshield. It's designed to not collapse on the driver. That glass should be like, you could just punch right through it after a bullet goes through it. By itself, yeah, pretty impossible to just punch through it. You would break your hand. Let's fast forward a little. Yeah, launching a car in the air, you, you gotta have like a ramp and for the car to like stay perfect and land like that. A bazillion different things have to go right for that to happen. Typically your car, when you're accelerating, the rotating force of your car pitches it forward a little bit. Your car needs enough energy to go off and then gradually come down. So it, doing that off of a bag of garbage, probably not, probably wouldn't work like that. And then airbags, airbags have this gas, this really shitty toxic gas inside and that's what they explode on impact. It's just like this little trigger mechanism that happens in the front of the car. I don't think you would be like playfully like playing with it. Like it flings your arms out and it's supposed to inhibit your ability to move. That's the whole idea of it. So like him driving and just kind of like beating on it, that's not true. This is the movie Rat Race. Oh. He's driving this amazing Bronco. I forgot, this is actually a pretty good movie. If it's strong enough to just keep on going and pulling, then that's a tow rope that he's using. In theory, it should be able to do exactly what it's doing, which is yank it on up there. We put winches on off-road cars. Your winch should be more powerful than the poundage of your car. So if your car weighs 4,500 pounds, you should have a winch that is capable of pulling more than 4,500 pounds. So if you want to test that out, you just hook your car into a tree and you flick it on and then your car goes hanging in the tree. Uh, look, you can see there's like a little lift underneath the car. That rope is stronger than that metal. So like the, that big metal radar thing would break off before the rope would snap. I mean, tow ropes are supposed to take like 20,000 pounds or something like that. So like you're supposed to be able to hook multiple cars on you know, like if you're off-roading and you need to get your, your buddy's rig out of the mud, it's not just the weight of his truck that you gotta get out, it's the weight of however much it's stuck. So it's that multiplied by how much force is grabbing onto the truck. Hanging from the steering wheel is totally possible. It goes through your firewall and then it goes to your steering box. That's metal on metal on metal, and there's many bolts that hold that in place. But that being said, race cars 
you have to remove the steering wheel typically because you gotta get out of the car. And by the underneath of that car, I think it's actually a real car and I think they hoisted up a real car. It looked like there was like a little track system underneath the car that's probably for safety reasons. Like, you know, just in case that rope did break or maybe that rope isn't actually doing it. So this is absolutely ridiculous Hollywood kind of fantasy, but totally feasible. Next up we have um, X-Men Dark Phoenix. Oh. Sweet, there's all that tempered glass that I was talking about. <laughs> I don't know about launching like that, but like, I would think that everything would just come to a dead stop. Typically to launch a car, you need something that's creating lift. So if you're gonna hit just on the edge of it, I would think that they would just hit and spin off. Let's rewind that. Okay, so it's up in the air and then it now is spinning the other way because it was spinning this way. So now it's spinning this way. All right, so it's already defied gravity and now it's deciding to hit and roll over. It looks like they like might have really crashed a car and then just like stuck some cameras in there. Cause that looks, that looks really real. And if they didn't, that's amazing CGI or whatever. So this is gone in 60 seconds. So pulling the ignition out of a cylinder actually does work on older cars. If you look at a modern day key, it'll have a dot on it. And if it has a dot, that means it has a microchip in it. And that means that when you put your key in your car, it sends a signal to the computer that says, we're friends and we can do this. Old cars, there's really only like three wires. And so if you pull that out, you could stick a screwdriver and just spin it. So, okay, so that, that car has a, a, a coded key, and what she's doing is, is she's sticking the, there is a Ferrari uh, recoding key. It's really expensive, you only get it if you're a Ferrari dealership, and it's so you can recode keys. Normally when you, your Ferrari doesn't start and you lost the keys, they tow it back to the Ferrari dealership and they give you a new ECU, which is your computer of your car, and then they give you a new locking mechanism, like five or $10,000, depending on what year your car is. It's ridiculously expensive. So if you own a Ferrari, don't lose your keys. I don't know, it's too early to tell. So she pressed a button and that is a starter switch. So that's a thing that we use in, to start engines when you're like testing engines. So when you do the starter, you plug that into the starter motor itself, which is attached to the engine. So when you're pressing the trigger button, that means that either you don't wanna go inside and start it yourself, or you don't have somebody else to help you, or it's because you don't know which wire to spin. But on a modern car, you wouldn't be using the trigger. Without the key in, without it programmed, the car won't start. It cuts off, it has a, a fail safe in it. So like modern Ferraris are actually pretty clever. They cut the fuel line off as well as disabling the ignition. So they're a big pain in the ass. That's why, like if you're stealing a Ferrari, it's because you either have the key or you are holding the person ransom. But... Okay, so this is planes, trains, and automobiles. Push, I am, I am. Oof. Push, for Christ's sake. Oh. I think we have to rock it a bit. This car is a Buick LeSabre, and it was like notoriously the ugliest car ever created but they would never break down. They were so like overbuilt. So right before this, this car was on fire and and like surprisingly st still kicking. This looks like the, just the roof caught on fire, the back end of the car, but like it being lit on fire and driving around, possible. So good, hand signals. Like the wheels wobbling. So when your wheels wobble, that's it's either because your wheels are, are not balanced properly or they're not on correctly. So the, the car like moving steadily, I mean, that's it's obviously real, but it just means that that poor car has been through a lot. So he's got a donut in the rear, just, and then he's got his wheels wobbling. It looks like the donut's more stable than the actual wheels. It looks like the side panels from the Woody. It's kind of like just having a campfire on, on the side of your car. 
say with any degree of accuracy exactly uh, how fast we were going. 78 miles an hour. 78. I don't think that car could go 78 miles an hour with two wobbly wheels and a donut. You're only supposed to go like 30 miles an hour on them. It says it on it. They're a little piece of rubber and there's like not that much air in them. You're supposed to just like hobble off the road. So like continue to drive on one going 78 miles an hour. I wouldn't do that. Now you got no outside mirror. No, we lost that. You have no functioning gauges. No, not a one. However, the radio still works. I mean, you could get rid of all of the your instrument panel. It still work. It's, I mean, the instrument panel is just telling you what's what's happening in the engine and things like that, like how fast or how many maybe your oil pressure, or your your vaults and your charging system. But like, generally speaking, that's just showing you what's going on. It's not doing anything other than just a display. So you can technically rip all of that out of your car, and your car will still keep on going. Uh, we watched a bunch of car clips today. I hope you liked it as much as I did. Thanks for watching.